This is Charlie Milburn in the Hit Exchange Media Newsroom, where Hit Exchange Executive Editor Eric Hibbs is joining us. Welcome, Eric. Hello, Charlie. You recently returned from interviewing Dr. Martin Cohn. He's the Chief Medical Scientist for IBM's Care Delivery Systems. Dr. Cohen, who is a medical doctor, discussed his role on a team that is helping to move Watson, IBM's supercomputer, into the healthcare environment and what Watson technologies might mean to the field of medicine. Thanks, Eric. Let's take a look at what Dr. Cohen had to share. The largest uh, part of the information available about patients, for example, in healthcare right now is unstructured text, textual data. And there's very little ability to use that information, even though it is the bulk of information we have available about patients. So Watson's special fort is natural language processing. Um, and so its ability to understand, interpret the meaning of language um, in healthcare um, is, is very powerful. So it can, for example, um, understand information provided by a clinician about an encounter with a patient. It can ingest and understand the text unstructured information within an electronic health record as well as the structured numerical data. And it can read a um, hundred million or more pages a second of healthcare literature. So it can combine all these sources of information to find what is relevant, most relevant for this particular patient and physician encounter uh, to help make the decisions that have to be made at that time. The amount of uh, healthcare information that exists is, is overwhelming. Um, it, it just um, thousands and thousands of articles. Uh, for instance, there's a, a database of research studies. Um, and as of about a month ago, um, that database listed 650,000 randomized controlled double blind studies that are used to make healthcare decisions. Um, there are thousands and thousands of new articles published every year. It's well beyond the ability of any one person to consume or assimilate. So when I was in full-time practice, for example, and had to you know, read many journals to keep current in, in my field, uh, which was emergency medicine, I'd read emergency medicine journals, but I was always also an executive, so I read healthcare management journals and cardiology journals. And you know, the stack of journals to be read kept on building up you know, in my study. And the only question is how high it was going to get before it fell over. There was just too much information out there. And when you read through all this information, then it's a matter of reading it, learning it, and remembering it when you need it. So Watson is a tool that can read through all these stacks of journals and textbooks and understand um, the language from its ability to process language, what is going on in a particular encounter. Um, and learn more from the patient's record and put all this together and get the relevant information, suggestions to the clinician and the patient, information that is more relevant to the decision to be made. So uh, be able to process these terabytes of information that a, a person could not possibly go through. If I'm reading through you know, a large number of journal articles about a particular clinical situation, you know, there's no guarantee that those articles are, are accurate and things change over time. So things that I was taught when I was a medical student and a resident as being the only way to manage certain kinds of problems have since been shown to not only be uh, useless, but frankly dangerous. I mean, so this transition occurs all the time. Watson, um, uh, amongst it, its, its, its skills, um, can assign reliability factors to the sources of information that it, that it uses by learning which sources are more likely to give accurate information, and this requires feedback from professionals. It assigns reliability to it, just as it did in playing the game of Jeopardy. It would understand that certain sources that it, it stored would more likely give the correct response to the Jeopardy, um, uh, Jeopardy answer. Um, so Watson will do the same thing. Um, and we are not, for instance, with respect to diagnosis, um, planning that Watson will give the physician the diagnosis. Um, that, that's not our goal for many reasons. Uh, it's, it's not possible. Uh, there may be more than one diagnosis involved, for, for example. Um, but by understanding um, the language of the interaction with the clinician and patient, and the information that exists and its ability to process the literature brings suggestions back to the physician that are more likely to be relevant to the decision at hand. So again, if we're looking at diagnosis 
and that's only one area in you know, which we're working. Um, it may bring to the physician um, five or six or 10 or 15 suggestions as these diagnoses fit the pattern of information that we have and to you know, uh, provide that assistance to physicians. We know from how, uh, from studies of how diagnosis, um, we, of studies of the diagnostic process, um, and within that, um, patterns of behavior that lead to errors in diagnosis, we know what support is necessary to overcome some of those tendencies to error. Uh, for example, um, one of the common sources of um, coming to a, an incorrect diagnostic conclusion is called the flaw of availability where you speak to the patient you know, for a short period of time and start to form in your mind um, ideas about what the diagnosis will be. And then another human phenomenon called the self-reinforcing perception bias takes over. And everybody suffers from this. You have some ideas, you start to focus on information that supports your original thoughts and systematically ignore information that would detract from the validity of those initial thoughts. Physicians do the same thing, we all do the same thing. It's, you know, Probably a lot, lot of politics is based on you listen for things that support your candidate and ignore th um, other things. Um, Watson, by not having that bias and access to a lot more information, can keep all the likely diagnoses in the can of the physician. So overcome that flaw of availability, for example. So we're not counting on Watson coming up with the diagnosis but just by understanding how reliable its sources are and the information that's available, keeping these thoughts in front of the physician to, to help um, um, reduce the likelihood of errors. It is not our goal and it's not achievable to replace physicians. Um, I, I've been asked that question many times and categorically, no, that is, that is not our goal. The relationship between physician, and when I say physician, I mean any healthcare provider clinician, because with a nurse practitioner or a physician's assistant, we view this as a support for all of them and they each have important roles in, in caring for patients. Um, but that personal relationship, uh, the you know your understanding of, of your relation of you know the years of relationship with the patient, uh, interpreting body language, and you know um, you know that somebody comes in complaining of severe pain, you know from your experience that they always complain of severe pain, and so whatever suggestions may come to you, you will filter th with your knowledge of the patient. We're not going to re replace that at all. And I said Watson is not going to make a diagnosis, it's not going to suggest the only possible therapy. It is going to provide information about available diagnoses and therapies for the physician to help them with, more, with better prioritized um, information to, uh, to make the better decisions that they want to make in the first place. One of the decisions uh, we're, we're making is um, how and when will Watson be implemented? Um, and you know, right now our thought is it would be volitional on the part of the clinician when they wanted that additional um, information or help. Um, you know, m most interactions between patients and, and clinicians are fairly straightforward. You know, 70, 80 percent of them, it, it, it's very clear what's going on and you, know, you, you would not refer to a textbook or any other line source um, or Watson for most of those cases. So the idea that the physicians or clinicians would use this for every encounter um, is, is not helpful. Um, so we're not looking in that direction. But when it's you know, either a, a complex case where the clinician decides they want some help, um, that's when they might um, use Watson, or maybe there would be certain triggers, like if a patient comes back for the third time with the same symptoms and no improvement, you know, the clinician might say, you know, I, I better start looking for something else. So something in, in that context. So if we focus on those areas where Watson is more likely to have value, then yes, we think that would improve efficiency and, and workflow. But I don't think it would, if the expectation was it would, be supporting of every encounter. You know, if you come in with a runny nose and an earache, you know, um, and you're not particularly sick, I, I, I don't need Watson to, to help manage that. The, the future of healthcare is moving towards collaboration um, amongst all the providers of healthcare, but also the, all the other participants in the healthcare process, the payers, um, 
uh, pharmaceutical industry. You know, there's everybody working together and collaborating to avoid the unnecessary or repetitive and to focus on value for the patient. So if you look at some of the processes, the bureaucratic processes right now that slow down healthcare and make it more expensive without adding any real value, you see some other opportunities. So if we look at one thing, for example, the relationship between the providers and the payers, it's a very expensive relationship. There are some studies that came out last year that, um, uh, that show that for the average physician in the United States, the cost of interacting with the payers is between sixty dollars and $80,000 a year. That includes the cost, you know, the, the salaries for all the business employees in the office plus the time the physician spends filling out forms. So you submit a bill, it gets rejected, you have to resubmit it, or you have to get prior approval for a diagnostic or therapeutic intervention, it gets rejected, you send it back. So that's just the cost in the, in the practices. And that's estimated to be as much as 10% of total revenue. The other side of that, the payers have a very expensive bureaucracy to manage all these things, to prove that, that they're you know, uh, that they're not being, you know, taken advantage of and paying for something that has no value. Well, imagine if both these groups kind of work together in a collaborative mode and Watson was available to both of them. And with Watson's ability to review, you know, millions or hundreds of millions of pages of literature and bring evidence into that decision process so that the, um, the decision the physician makes to say, you um, to uh, order a diagnostic test or a therapeutic intervention is recognized as being evidence-based because Watson was involved and the payer has accepted that too. So that following that evidence-based recommendation means automatic approval and you don't need all this exchange of paperwork and, and whatever. Just, you know, if, if you're talking about 10% of the revenue in, in medical practice is going to this kind of busy work, how much do you have, to, what fraction of that do you have to save to really cut down the cost of, of healthcare? Thank you